Thanks everyone for coming to my talk. I'm going to be talking about mean estimation when you have the source code or quantum Monte Carlo methods. Uh, my name's Robin. Uh, I'm at Google Quantum AI, but this work was done while I was at Microsoft Quantum. And this is joint work with Ryan O'Donnell, who's a professor at Carnegie Mellon, but this work was partly done while he was visiting me at Microsoft Quantum. All right, let's get right into it. So what is the task of Monte Carlo mean estimation? So imagine you have access to a discrete value, discrete real valued random variable, capital X. And the way you have access to this random variable is through a black box. So you have some box, uh, every time you press this, this little orange button on the top, you get out a real number X with some probability P sub X. And these probabilities are non-negative and they sum to one, you know, as probabilities tend to do. And your goal is to estimate the mean of this random variable. So the mean is just uh, the sum over x, px times x. OK. So what, what would you do if you, if you had to solve this task? Um, and let's say I let you take around n samples. What, what do you do? And kind of the most obvious thing to do is just, well, take n samples. You'll see n real numbers x and just uh, compute their average. Right? You know, just compute the empirical mean of the numbers you see. Uh, and this is good. But, uh, but you want to you know, prove something rigorous about it. You want to say, how, how close is this to the actual mean, the true mean mu? And one way you can prove this is using Chebyshev's inequality. And what it gives you is that if you take around n samples and output the empirical mean, this estimate that you get, mu hat, will be close to mu. And the closeness will be sigma divided by root n, where sigma is the standard deviation of this random variable x. And if you think about this, um, this is optimal. And it doesn't really matter if you're using a classical algorithm or a quantum algorithm. Um, there's really no scope for a quantum algorithm to have a speed up because the question is just about how many samples do you need from this black box. And the black box is just giving classical samples. So uh, this is all you can do. And even if you knew, knew what sigma is. Uh, no, note that the algorithm that I just described, where you just take, just average the uh, samples that you see, that algorithm didn't need to know sigma. But even if I told you what sigma was, you, you can't actually do any better. OK, so this is the basic task. And there's nothing to do here because, uh, well, this is the best. Um, and this is optimal. So we have to change the question a little bit. And the question we ask is, instead of this being a black box, uh, what if it was, well, not a black box? So in other words, uh, what if you had the source code for this random variable? So what if this random variable was produced by some algorithm? And one very re reasonable example is, uh, let's say you have a randomized algorithm that, uh, as output, gives you this x with probability p sub x. And this is a pretty standard fact that if you have a randomized algorithm that does something, you can always pull the randomness out of the algorithm. In other words, you can view it as a deterministic algorithm that accepts some seed randomness, and then it, it has the same output. So the way you can think about it is you have this deterministic algorithm. It takes r random bits, and I'm going to call the randomness i, and it outputs some x, which is a function of i, so I'm going to call it xi. And the probability of a given x is the number of times this xi appears in the output divided by the total of number of different random seeds, which I'm going to call d. So you can think of this deterministic algorithm as just encoding some d bits, d, it's not bits, d real numbers, x1 through xd. And the mean is now simplified to just this, this object over here. We're just trying to compute the average of these d numbers. So th th this is the model that I want you to keep in mind for the rest of the talk. But our algorithms actually work with an even more general model, because this model is pretty classical. Uh, the model our algorithms also work with is uh, you know, the, a quantum model, which is where y you have some quantum circuit U. And on some canonical starting state, let's say the all-zero state, what the quantum circuit does is it'll output uh, this probability distribution, or this, this quantum state, rather, which is a quantum superposition over different x's with the correct amplitude. So the amplitude is the square root of the probability so that when you make a computational bas basis measurement, you'll get the correct probability over here. And there's some garbage here, because in general, when you convert a classical algorithm to a quantum algorithm, you will get some garbage. And because we're proving algorithms in this work, it's more general for us to assume that, that there is garbage. So if you had access to this without the garbage, that's, that's even better. And when we say we have access to the quantum circuit U, we'll assume we have access to the circuit and its inverse and controlled versions of. So if you had a deterministic algorithm uh, for computing X size, for example, you can, you can certainly construct a quantum circuit with the same gate complexity and its inverse and its controlled versions. So for the rest of the talk, just keep this model in mind. So you just have some, uh, some circuit that you can feed in I and you'll get XI. OK, cool. So what, what, do we, what do we do in this model? This is our main result. We show um, a quantum algorithm that's computationally efficient, which means it has um, you know, reasonable gate complexity, that uses order n samples. And by that, I mean it uses this unitary on the last slide, or it uses that function on the last slide, order n times. 
and it outputs an estimate with this guarantee, which is that your estimate is close to the real value, the true mu, uh, to error sigma over n. And to compare with what I had on the first slide, uh, Chebyshev's inequality classically gives you sigma over root n. So, so this, is, this is the difference. The n became a root n, so it's a quadratic speed up in sample complexity. And our algorithm is optimal for quantum algorithms, uh, again, even if you know sigma. And just like the classical algorithm, it has two very nice features. One is that it works without knowing an upper bound on the standard deviation sigma. Just like, as I said, the classical algorithm just takes a bunch of numbers, takes their average. It doesn't need to know what sigma is. And secondly, the classical algorithm doesn't need to know an upper bound on the random variable. Like, it didn't need to assume that the random variable was bounded between 0 and 1. It was just, just gets some bunch of real numbers. It takes their average. And our quantum algorithm will also have this nice property. It doesn't need to assume a bound on the random variable. OK, cool. So. What I wanted to quickly say is that many problems are special cases of Monte Carlo mean estimation. And for example, search, the search problem, the, uh, the problem that's solved by Grover's algorithm, is also a special case. Maybe I won't work through the math, but I just want to tell you what, what are the two inputs. So in Grover's algorithm, you're trying to distinguish the all zeros input from an input that has at least one one. So the all zeros input is an input whose mean is zero. It's just a bunch of numbers that are all zero. Their mean is zero. Or in the other case, you have all numbers that are zero except one, one number is one. So if there's D numbers, then the mean is one over one over D, and you're trying to distinguish these two. So if you do mean estimation to precision, well, well, less than one over D, then, or maybe one over half times this, or whatever, you'll be able to tell these two apart. And if you plug in our numbers, uh, you'll, you'll recover Grover's result. Um, okay, it's not very exciting to recover Grover's algorithm, but I just wanted to mention that search is a special case of mean estimation. And in fact, uh, many algorithms are a special case of mean estimation. And here's a table from our paper that shows a bunch of stuff can be viewed as special cases of mean estimation. One example is this quantum counting algorithm from this paper, if you've seen this before. That's also an example of mean estimation. You're trying to count the number, approximately count the number of ones in a string. Um, maybe the most relevant work to compare with is these last two rows. Uh, so the way we formulated this mean estimation task was, uh, I think, first done by Ashley Montanaro here in this work. And compared to our work, his work, uh, there's two differences. One is he needs to know an upper bound on the standard deviation. So that's one of the things I said. You don't need to have this a priori upper bound in our algorithm. And secondly, the algorithm is suboptimal in terms of sample complexity. has a bunch of log factors. So we, we don't have these two. This uh, later work by Hamoudi removed one of these restrictions. It didn't need to know this upper bound, but it still had the, the log factors. OK, cool. So I can, I can now tell you about our algorithm. So how do we solve this? mean estimation task. And the way we do it is first by reducing this, this more complicated task to a simpler task. So okay, the top box is the thing I claimed. Uh, an algorithm uses n samples, gives you an estimate of the mean of the random variable to order si to sigma over n. OK, and we do a reduction. And this reduction is, uh, it's, it's not very complicated, but there's a bunch of things we do. But they're, they're essentially all classical tricks, just things that everybody's familiar with, like binary searching. and. Uh, majority votes and like the union bounds over stuff. So, okay, it's not very deep. Uh, the one quantum ingredient we use is uh, Hamoudi's quantum algorithm for quantile estimation from this previous paper. And this algorithm can also be essentially viewed as minimum findings. So if you're familiar with this quantum query algorithm of minimum finding from like the late 90s or so, it's essentially that algorithm, but it's a, it's a little more clever. So that's the only quantum ingredient. Everything else is classical. And this reduction is it, it's long, but it's, it's, it's straightforward. And it brings us to a much nicer and simpler task, which is where we, in this problem, we know much more about the random variable. And we are asked to solve a much simpler task, a decision problem. So what are we given here? We're promised that the expectation value of the square of the random variable is at most 1. So th this quantity is, is different from the standard deviation, because the standard deviation is the expectation value of the random variable minus the mean squared. So this, this number is even bigger than the standard deviation. And we're promised that this thing is less, less than 1. And we don't have to compute mu. We just have to distinguish between two cases. So mu is either smaller than epsilon over 2 or it's bigger than epsilon. And we're given 1 over epsilon samples. And what you can see is that this, this simpler task is a special case of the main result because, um, because OK, so we're trying to distinguish these two cases of mu. Like it's less than epsilon over 2 or bigger than epsilon. So if you uh, estimate mu additively to, say, epsilon over 4 or so, you'll be able to tell these two apart. So here we need this right-hand side to be epsilon over 4. Because the expectation value of x squared is less than 1, this implies the standard deviation is less than 1. So this thing is 1 at most. So if you want the right-hand side to be less than epsilon over 4, I can take n to be 1 over epsilon-ish, which is exactly the sample complexity I want. So 
this simpler task is a special case of the thing I was going to solve. And in fact, what we show is they're equivalent. So if you solve one, you solve the other. Cool. So now you can forget about this mean estimation task. This is the task we want to solve. So for the rest of the talk, I'll tell you how we, how we solve this task. OK. And so what, what do we do? Our algorithm is essentially Grover's algorithm, everyone's favorite uh, quantum algorithm with a quadratic speed up, Grover's algorithm. But, but it's not literally Grover's algorithm. I mean, because, you know, well, OK, then there wouldn't be so many papers on this problem trying to solve this and getting rid of the log factors. It's Grover's algorithm, but with complex phases. And, and I'll explain uh, what that is. OK, so since our algorithm is based on Grover's algorithm, let me give you a recap of Grover's algorithm. Maybe, maybe everyone's seen this before, but anyway, it doesn't hurt to do a recap. So Grover's algorithm has two unitaries in it. Um, the first one I'm going to call it R, R for reflection, because it's a reflection about the uniform superposition. So the uniform superposition is this state over here, 1 over square root of D, superposition over all ket i's. And a reflection about it just means identity minus 2 times ket u bra u. And we're also going to use this, this same unitary in our algorithm, so that's cool. And uh, keep in mind that this unitary is actually independent of the inputs. You know, you know in Grover's algorithm, there's this n-bit string or d-bit string x, and you're trying to compute whether it's all zeros or one of them is one. Uh, this, this unitary has nothing to do with that x. So this is an input-independent unitary. The, the second unitary in Grover's algorithm is the input-dependent unitary, which is, I'm going to call it p for phase oracle, because it puts a phase. And what does this oracle do? It takes ket i and puts a phase of minus 1 to the power of xi, ket i. So that means when xi is 1, it puts a phase of minus 1. and xi is 0, it puts a phase of plus 1. So this is the unitary that we're not going to use in our work. And uh, it's because in Grover's algorithm, there's only two kinds of xi, right? Either xi is 0 or 1. In our thing, xi was a real number. It was a real value random variable. So xi can be anything between minus infinity and plus infinity. So we certainly can't have a map that just takes all of this information and maps it to two different values. So we're going to have to do something different. And I already said earlier what we're going to do. Instead of using two different values, plus 1 and minus 1, we're going to use an arbitrary complex number of unit modulus. So it's going to be a phase e to the i theta. So what do we do? So in Grover's algorithm, you have this oracle. Um, instead of minus 1 or plus 1, I want to have a real number from, uh, or rather, I want to have a phase on the, on the unit circle. So in other words, uh, I want to have a number between minus pi and pi. So that's, that's what a phase on the unit circle is. So how do you map a real number from minus infinity to plus infinity to minus pi to pi? So I, I need a map that does this. Uh, there's many maps that do that. But if you, I don't know, if you think about it, uh, one very reasonable map is tan inverse. So tan inverse will do this. And that's, that's the map we use, or, or maybe like 2 times tan inverse or whatever. Constants don't really matter. And if you want some intuition for what this map does, here's just some graphs of what tan inverse is. So uh, this is arc, the arctan function. This is, as you can see, when you go from minus infinity to plus infinity, this function will remain bounded between uh, pi and minus pi. Another way to think about arctan, which is pretty cool in terms of pictures, is arctan is the, uh, of, of y is the angle between the complex line 1 plus iy and 1 minus iy. This, this angle over here is arctan. So as you can see, as I make y bigger and bigger, this line will go as much as that, that line over there, and this line will become this guy over here, and so the maximum angle will be pi. Okay, so that's that's the that's the other oracle, uh, the other unitary algorithm. So, so I'm almost done with the description of our algorithm because there's only two operators in our algorithm. I've described both of them to you. I just have to tell you what we do with these two operators in the algorithm. And to tell you what we do, first I have to make a, tell you about um, a technical fact, or th this is going to be the under th what underpins our algorithm. And this is the main technical claim. Uh, the, the thing in the box above is I just copied the task from before, so you don't have to read that. The technical claim is that the state ket u, this was the uniform superposition, has high overlap with an eigenvector of the unitary that is the product of these two unitaries, the reflection that we talked about and this phase oracle on the previous slide. And its eigenvalue is roughly the thing that we are trying to compute. We're trying to compute mu, and its eigenvalue is roughly e to the i2 mu, whatever. So it's this mu hiding in the phase. Okay, and why is this good for us? So this state has high overlap with this eigenvector. So let, let's forget about the high overlap part. Let's say u is literally an eigenvector. So just, just making this approximation. So let's say u is literally an eigenvector of capital U. This, this state is the uniform superposition, which we know how to create. It's very easy to create that on a quantum computer. This unitary is composed of a product of two unitaries. One was a reflection about the uniform superposition, also very easy to do on a quantum computer. The other was this phase oracle, which... Um, Oh, I didn't actually tell you how you implement it on a quantum computer, but it's pretty straightforward. You, you query your oracle x, xi, you write it down in a second register, you compute its arctan in another register, you look at that, put the phase in up front, 
uncompute arc tan. So it takes two queries to the oracle for x to compute this this unitary p. So r times p, this entire unitary is very easy to do on a quantum computer. The state u is easy to create. And I want to know what the eigenvalue is for, and I'm assuming this u is an eigenvector. So there's actually a famous quantum algorithm that does exactly this task, and it's called phase estimation. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with it, so you just run phase estimation. So that's one thing you can do, just run phase estimation on this unitary u, the state ket u. And what precision do you need? You, you want to distinguish these two values of mu, and mu is hiding up here in the phase, so I need the phase to, let's say, epsilon over 4 or so. So I do phase estimation to precision epsilon over 4, and if, if you know the complexity of phase estimation, the complexity is inverse of the precision, so that's going to be order 1 over epsilon. This is exactly the, what I was shooting for. So, so that's it. That's one way to run the algorithm. Uh, and in fact, there's actually a simpler way to run the algorithm, which is you don't need to do, use phase estimation because um, you have a promise on the eigenvalue. So in fact, what you can do is take this unitary u and raise it to a high enough power, a power roughly 1 over epsilon, and then this eigenvalue will get mapped to something pretty close to plus 1, the other one will get mapped to something very close to minus 1, and then you can run a much simpler algorithm called the Hadamard test that just uses like one ancillary qubit. But either way, it's a, it's a very straightforward algorithm. And, uh, and, and yeah, that's it. That's the whole algorithm. And in my remaining uh, five minutes or so, I can try to give you some <laughs> intuition for what's going on in the algorithm. So there are these pictures in the, in the paper, which I very much encourage you to read, because they will be somewhat illuminating about what's going on. So yeah, I had a choice between like showing you pictures or showing you technical parts of the proof, and I thought pictures will be more fun. Uh, that, okay, maybe I won't step through all these pictures, but uh, let me tell you wh what these pictures track in the paper, and then you can look at it if, you, if you're interested. So what we do is we give you an example in the paper of d equal to 7, and we track the state of the quantum algorithm. So the quantum algorithm starts out with a uniform superposition, so that means there's seven numbers in the quantum state that I want to track, which is the amplitude of each of the, uh, you know, each of the coefficients, basically, of the state. And when you start out, they're all 1, or 1 over root d, but we can forget about normalization, they're all 1. And as the algorithm progresses, these numbers change, right? And that's actually what we're tracking over here. So let's take, uh, let's take this picture over here. So the seven different numbers in my state are, are denoted with these different colored circles. There's a pink circle, blue circle, yellow circle, and so on. And as the algorithm progresses, these circles move around, and this black diamond over here is their average. Um, and the reason I plot the average is because I have these two different operators, P and R, and I have to understand how these points move in the, in the complex plane as I apply P and R. So it turns out this p operator is actually easy because like from its definition it was just putting a certain phase it was putting this phase of e to the i arc tan whatever uh, that's just a rotation in the complex plane so it just uh, let's see let's take an example of the p operator let's say you're going from uh, let's say you're going from here to here all the points are here and the pink point is over here it's where the black diamond is and the p operator is going to rotate by the angle that this p this pink line makes um, so that the lines are representing the angles of rotation. So this black point will roughly go over here, which is like two times the rotation angle, so it's here. So that's fine. So this is, uh, this is denoted, I mean, depicting these diagrams. The reason we have the black diamond is because we also want to know what the other operator does, which is this Grover diffusion operator, sometimes called the inversion about the mean operator. And it's called inversion about the mean because it actually just inverts about the mean. So you take all of these points, take their geometric mean, which is this black um, circle over here, black diamond over here, and when you apply this um, R operator, it's going to reflect a point in its mean. So let's say you have this pink point over here. The mean is this black diamond, so the pink point should come somewhere here, which is what it does when you apply it here. And as the algorithm progresses, like you can track how these points move, and uh, there's more pictures, and the points keep moving. Eventually, what happens when you move roughly one over the mean number of times, uh, the black diamond goes from here to here, and that corresponds to a phase of minus one. When you start with um, the uniform superposition, at the end, you'll end with minus the uniform superposition. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm not going to go into like proof details and so on, but um, if you're interested and you want some intuition for what's going on, you should look at the paper. There's like nice pictures like this. Um, so I have two minutes left, so let me tell you about, tell you about uh, two applications of this work. One, one is a more theoretical application, one is, uh, I guess one is more applied. The, the theoretical application is to, uh, we can reprove a result of Belov, so this was already shown by Alexander, but it's, uh, it's this task of distinguishing two probability distributions when you're given the source code for them. So there's two distributions, Q or R. You're given source code for one of them. You know, what, you know what Q and R are. You have descriptions of Q and R. But you're given source code for one of them. You don't know which one it is. You have to tell them apart. And classically, 
you need one over the Hellinger distance between these two distributions squared. That's that's what, and this is what Hellinger distance is. And uh, Belov showed that quantumly you need only one over Hellinger distance. We can recover this by just viewing it as the task of estimating the mean of some random variable. The random variable is this complicated random variable right here. But you just estimate the mean, and it has two different values based on what it is. It'll give you, uh, it'll tell you whether it's Q or R. So that's one uh, one application. Um, a more applied application is to um, quantum algorithms for finance. If you've seen any of these papers, uh, they all use Monte Carlo mean estimation in it. And, and that's actually not a coincidence because apparently even in the real world, like today on classical computers, they do Monte Carlo mean estimation to solve these finance tasks. So, so quantum algorithms for finance, it makes sense that they use Monte Carlo mean estimation. These are some papers that use Monte Carlo mean estimation in them. And I'm pretty sure in all of them, you could use an algorithm and uh, get a slightly better algorithm. You'll shave some log factors. Um, okay, uh, yeah, I'm out of time, and that's, that's all I want to say. Um, thank you very much. Okay, we have time for questions. Um, have felt, if you have high values that the t arc tangent function, why the, this should work, or the algorithm? Oh, yes, that's a good question. So you're saying, in this arc tangent function, there could be values that are pretty high, um, and say they, they map to something pretty close. Um, why does this still work? So in, in this version of the problem that I said, you know, the simplified version of the problem, uh, we assumed that the expectation value of the random variable squared was at most one. So if some, if there is an x that takes extremely large values, it can happen only with probability one over the value squared or something, so that the expectation value condition works out. So it can't contribute too much to the mean. So if you if you have two values that are super large and you think that the arc tan is going to be really close, then the the difference between those two values is also not going to contribute much to the mean. So so it doesn't matter. Thanks. Hi. Um, um, the algorithm that you presented, obviously that's quite similar to Grover, but it also is quite similar to another algorithm that I've been reading about. Are you familiar with Ben Reichardt's work on span program quantum yeah. algorithms? Mm -hmm. So they also have like t two reflections and you kind of like look for an eigenvector and you know, you also sort of like use Grover as an example and uh, yeah, I just wonder like if you've looked at any connections there. Uh, yeah, well, well one thing I can say is that um, Many quantum algorithms have exactly this format of two reflections, including like, yeah, half the quantum algorithms by people in this room, like I know Fred's uh, quantum walk algorithm also has this exact two, two reflection structure, and like, Alexander has written many papers. So somehow this is just a property of quantum algorithms that you have two reflections, <laughs> and um, eventually you either do them many times or you do phase estimation on top of it. It's like a general recipe for designing quantum algorithms. Uh, but, but specifically related to span programs, I should say, we, we did come up with a span program version of this algorithm. Uh, you can do that. It seemed more complicated. Uh, this was simpler. Um, so we eventually chose to present it like this. But uh, yeah, we did have a formulation with span programs, but uh, it, it didn't really bias anything. So we, we decided to do it this way. Thank you. I guess we do have time for more questions. Hi, thank you for the talk, very nice talk. Um, so I, I have the intuition that this is very similar to when you have an interferometry, like this Heisenberg limit, um, where you have one divided by square root of n and it's moved transition to one over n. It looks like you are trying to extract a global phase, which is like e to the i, your mean. Have you explored that? Or is that intuitive to you, or have you thought about that? Ah, I see. Right. You're saying that it, it looks like we're trying to extract the global phase. Uh, yeah, exactly. It, Some kind of global phase that is your mean. Th that's right. So I presented it that way, that um, it, okay. It, okay, you have this thing, and its eigenvalue is something. And like in the two cases that I'm trying to distinguish, in one case, let's say the eigenvalue is plus one. The other case, the eigenvalue is minus one. Yeah, you can't literally extract the global phase. That, that wouldn't make sense. This is why in the beginning, I actually assumed that you have controlled versions of all of these operators. So actually, I'll be able to make controlled u, which will then uh, make the global phase into a, into a, uh, into a relative phase. So, in, so, so by putting the right state in, in one case I'll get like the plus state on the control cube, but in the other state, in the other case I'll get the minus state, and uh, and that's how I'll extract it. If I if I didn't have the control versions, then, then then you're right, it would just be a global phase, and I wouldn't wouldn't be able to pick it up. Okay, one last eventually. 
Non, so, thank you again.